So if you can all see this, it says atomics theory, the structure of matter. I do have that on so we can see. Good, okay, so here we go. So uh, Chem 1A is the first half of general chemistry. And uh, many years ago when I started teaching this, I thought, how should I teach chemistry? What would be the way that would make the most sense to me? And I thought, you know what? I think I should talk about atoms first. Then after we learn about atoms, which is our first test, what do those atoms do? They combine to form compounds. So we're gonna talk about how they bond together to make compounds, that's test two. All these atoms and compounds exist as solids, liquids, and gases. We're gonna talk about properties of solids, liquids, and gases, that's test three. After we do that, we're gonna talk about how they undergo chemical reactions, that's test four. And after that, we'll be more specific, we'll talk about properties of gases, and we'll talk about thermodynamics. So to do that, the order of the chapters go 2, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 5, 6, because that just made sense in my mind many years ago when I first started teaching this. And ironically enough, they now write books in which the chapters go in that exact order. So maybe I had something right all, all, all along anyway. So that's why we're starting where we are. And the beginning of the story of chemistry really starts with trying to understand what everything is made of, because when people started looking around and seeing water and rocks and metal and air, they were, what makes up everything? And the Greeks were the first ones to actually try to think about that. And the Greeks seemed to think that there were probably some fundamental types of matter, some elementary types of matter, which they called elements. And the Greeks thought there were four elementary types of matter which could combine to make everything that was seen in the known universe. Any idea what those four elementary types of matter were that the Greeks thought? If you have an idea, unmute yourself and, and give a shout. Earth, what is water, fire, and air. Exactly right. Yeah. They thought those were elementary basic types of matter that can combine to form everything we saw in the universe. And they were actually wrong on all four accounts. Those weren't elementary forms of matter, but the idea that matter is made up of elementary types of things was true. And about 2,000 years later, in 1661, an English chemist, Robert Boyle, uh, identified whether given types of matter that you could find around in the visible universe were basic elementary types of matter or not. If they were, he called them elements. But if they weren't the elementary form of matter, he called them compounds. And so Robert Boyle identified uh, matter as either being composed of elements or compounds. And the definitions he used are the ones we still use today. An element is a basic type of matter, which means it cannot be broken down. So, oh, what was that? Get that out of there. So an element is any substance you find in nature that cannot be decomposed to simpler substances by chemical means. It cannot be decomposed to simpler substances by chemical means. But if you have something that can be decomposed, then it's not an element. He called it a compound. So a compound is any substance that can be decomposed into something simpler. <clears throat> so if we go back to the Greeks for a minute. Uh, we were told that the Greeks thought that water was an elemental substance. Well, how would Robert Boyle show if water was an elemental substance or not? He would take water and he would try to decompose it. Can water be decomposed into something simpler? So if you take a glass of water and you stick two electrodes in it and you attach those electrodes to a battery and you pass electricity through that water, you will cause in the two electrodes colorless gases to bubble off. And if you identify those two colorless gases, those are hydrogen and oxygen. So by passing electricity through water, we can actually decompose water into two simpler things. Water is not an element then. It's not a fundamental building block of matter because you can break it down into simpler things, which are probably fundamental building blocks of matter. Now, if you take the hydrogen gas and the oxygen gas and you pass electricity through them, doesn't matter how much electricity you pass through them, 
they do not change into anything new. So from experimental work, Boyle and others were able to determine that hydrogen and oxygen cannot be decomposed into simpler things. They must be elements. But water, because it could be decomposed, is not an element. Water must be composed of elements, so we call it a compound. And as people tested different types of matter, they started to accumulate a list of things that could not be broken down, a list of elements. And that list of elements now appears in the classrooms of every chemistry class in the world. And that uh, chart that you find in those classrooms is called the periodic table. There are 118 different things on a periodic table. That means we believe there are 118 different types of matter that cannot be decomposed. They're the simplest forms of matter. They're called elements. And everything else that makes up the universe are combinations of those elements somehow bonded together to make more complex things like water, like salt, which we call compounds. Now, in 1789, there was a French chemist named uh, uh, Anton Lavoisier, and Lavoisier was doing experiments on chemical reactions. And he was measuring the masses of the reactants and products in chemical reactions, and he was able to determine experimentally that mass was conserved during chemical changes. <clears throat> conserved means it's not created, not destroyed. So for example, Lavoisier took charcoal and rust and then he heated them up. And a lot of times when you're gonna heat something up in chemistry, you use the symbol of a triangle to represent heated. So that little yield sign has a triangle next to it. It means we're heating up the charcoal and rust. It will turn into iron and fixed air, which at that time was the name for carbon dioxide. <clears throat> and if you measured out the mass of the charcoal and rust to start with, and that's what Lavoisier did, he measured out one gram of charcoal, nine grams of rust. <clears throat> he heated them up, turned them into iron and fixed air, and he measured the mass of iron and measured the mass of fixed air, it turns out their mass has turned out to be 6.3 and 3.7. The specific thing that he deduced was that the number of grams he started with is exactly the same as the number of grams he ended up with. You didn't create or destroy mass. And that was really significant because that means chemistry was quantitative. It obeys laws. Before this time, chemistry was known as alchemy because it was more of a mystical kind of magic stuff where people learn skills, how to do chemical reactions. Nobody really understood why things were happening and whether it was really scientific or not. People didn't know. But as soon as Lavoisier showed this numerical relationship, how the amount of mass of products and reactants have to be the same, that's when chemistry moved from the phase of hocus pocus into the realm of science and chemistry actually became a real science. Lavoisier is sometimes called the father of chemistry for actually having made this discovery that mass was conserved in chemical reactions. Uh, a couple years later, do you know what happened in France? History majors? What was happening in France around that time? I got some chats here. French Revolution is correct. And uh, Lavoisier, besides being a chemist, was a tax collector for the uh, monarchy and the French Revolution overthrew the monarchy. They didn't like the kings and queens and anybody that worked with them. And so they disposed of them with a device invented at the time called the guillotine. So after the king and queen were gone, they went after the tax collectors and one of them was Lavoisier. And in probably one of the most severe cutbacks in the history of science, Lavoisier's head was chopped off and he was no more. So a rather sad tale and a bad joke at that. But uh, Lavoisier was the original person to show that chemistry was a quantitative science. And that was significant. Now, within a decade, another chemist, Joseph Proust, was now doing experiments with chemical reactions. And he was looking at compounds and decomposing them into their elements. And Joseph Proust showed that any time a compound decomposed, it always had the same proportion of elements by mass. Proust showed that compounds always have the same proportion of elements by mass. 
So if we take a compound called mercuric calc and you heat this up, mercuric calc will decompose into two ethyl substances. It'll decompose into mercury and oxygen. Mercuric calc must therefore be a compound because it's decomposing into things that are simpler. And what Proust did is he was actually verifying Lavoisier's law of conservation of mass. He was measuring the mass of the mercuric calc to start with. He was verifying the mass of the mercury and oxygen afterwards would add up to five. And in fact, in his experimental work, it absolutely did. 4.63 grams plus 0.37 grams equals five. But then Proust went one step further, did something else. He said, I wonder what amount of that mercuric calc is due to the mercury. What fraction of it is mercury? And that would be numerically 4.63 out of the 5.00. If you divide 4.63 by 5.00 and multiply by 100, you're going to get a percentage. And if you want the percentage of oxygen in the mercuric calc, you would take the 0.37 grams, divide it by the 5.00 grams, multiply by 100, you would get a percentage of oxygen. So Proust showed from this experiment that a mercury calc is 92.6% mercury and 7.4% oxygen. I said, okay, that's interesting. So then he made another sample of mercuric calc, different mass, 8.92 grams, and he decomposed that and measured the mass of the mercury and the oxygen produced from there. And what he found was when he took 8.26 and divided by 8.92 times 100, and 0.66 divided by 8.92 times 100, he got the exact same percentages. That meant that no matter how many times he did this experiment, mercuric calc is always 92.6% mercury and 7.4% oxygen. Kind of weird. He dried different compounds and found compounds always had the same percentage of elements by mass. And he named this, he called this the law of definite proportion. So through experimental work, Proust showed that a specific compound always contains exactly the same proportion of elements by mass. <clears throat> now, what was the reason for that? Nobody knew. This was a natural phenomenon. Proust discovered that compounds always have a definite proportion. Nobody had any idea why. This is what science does. Science tries to explain natural phenomenon. And the answer for why compounds have a definite composition or a definite proportion came from an English uh, chemistry teacher named John Dalton within about 10 years, because Dalton made a proposition that people hadn't have thought of for a long, long time. If you go back to the time of ancient Greece, when the Greeks thought that the elemental types of matter were water, wind, uh, fire, and earth, there were different philosophers at the time. The philosophers were not only good in philosophy, but math and science as well. And there was a philosopher whose name was Democritus. And Democritus says, if you take an elemental substance, like they thought water was elemental, take a sample of water and divide it in half, divide it in half again, divide it again, divide it again, divide it again, keep dividing it, eventually you're gonna reach the smallest particle of that element and you can't divide it anymore. And he said the smallest particle of an element is called an atom from the Greek word atmos, which means indivisible. I always liked that word atmos. I was gonna name my first son atmos, but then he would have been atmosphere. That probably wouldn't have been good. So we went with something else. But nonetheless, uh, <clears throat> When Democritus proposed that in 450 BC, there was another philosopher around at the time. I don't know if you've ever heard of Democritus before, but I bet you've heard of Aristotle. Aristotle was a little bit more famous. He sort of had what I like to call the Michael Jordan effect. Back in the 80s and 90s, Michael Jordan was the best basketball player in the universe. He was actually the star of Space Jam before LeBron James started uh, being a person in Space Jam. And everybody loved Michael Jordan. They had Michael Jordan hats and everybody wore Michael Jordan jackets and they had his number 23, it was all over. And Aristotle kind of had this Michael Jordan effect. 
And Aristotle looked at what Democritus said. He said, you know, I bet you could take water, divide it in half, divide it in half. You could keep dividing it forever and ever and ever, and you'll never reach a smallest particle. And everybody loving Aristotle so much that, yeah, that Democritus is full of baloney, and they believe that uh, atoms didn't exist. So nobody had the idea of atoms for 2,000, what is this, 600, you know, 18 plus 200, 2,200 years. And when Dalton was thinking about the law of definite proportion, he said, ah, I think I can explain why that is. So he proposed that elements, which remember are the most elementary, simplest form of matter, he proposed that elements are composed of tiny particles called atoms, just like Democritus had said. And if we believe that, it will explain the law of definite proportion. Now, why did he say this? He was doing experimental work. And if we look at three different compounds that are made up of the elements carbon and hydrogen, if you combine a certain amount of carbon and hydrogen, you can form the compound ethyne. If you combine them slightly differently, you can form ethene. And if you combine them slightly differently, you can form ethane. These are three different compounds made between carbon and hydrogen. These elements make lots of compounds. And if you want to study the chemistry of carbon, you'll take organic chemistry, which you may wind up doing in a year from now. But he was able to show that if you break these compounds down, they have this definite proportion by mass. Ethine is always 12 grams of carbon to one gram of hydrogen. That's its definite proportion. Ethene is 12 grams of carbon to two grams of hydrogen. It's always that definite proportion. Ethane is 12 to three. We know compounds have definite proportions. We just don't know why. And so Dalton said, what if we assume, just an assumption, that carbon is made of atoms and hydrogen is made of atoms? So let's just suppose that. If we think for a minute that maybe this is true, let's think about how these atoms might combine together to make ethyne, ethene, and ethane. And before we go any further, we have to make another assumption. We have to know something about carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms. So let me just make something up. Let me say that the carbon atoms and the hydrogen atoms weigh the exact same amount. I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but we need some, some assumption here at the beginning. So let's say they do. So let me draw a picture of a carbon atom and a hydrogen atom. And I'll draw them uh, the same size so that we can infer from the pictures that they weigh the same amount. <clears throat> So somehow, these carbons and hydrogens are going to combine to make compounds of ethyne, ethene, and ethane. The ethyne has a ratio of 12 grams to 1 gram. Now, it could be 12 tons to 1 ton. The gram doesn't make any difference. So the important thing is the mass ratio is 12 to 1. So if these atoms were combined to make the compound, how could we get the ratio of carbon and hydrogen's masses to be 12 to 1? You would need, see if this makes sense to you. 12 carbon atoms to one hydrogen atom. If they all weigh the same amount, this would be 12 times the mass of carbon to the hydrogen. The mass ratio would be 12 to one. So Dalton would say that an ethyne molecule must take 12 carbon atoms to somehow bond to one hydrogen atom to create a molecule that has 12 carbons and one hydrogen. If that's how you form ethyne, then every time you make that, what's their mass ratio? 12 to one. It would have to be, okay? How about ethene? It has a mass ratio of 12 to two. So you could get that mass ratio if you take 12 carbons and two hydrogens, this would be the ratio of 12 to two. He would say an ethene molecule must be 12 carbons bonding to two hydrogens because that's how you get the ratio of 12 to two. Or is there another way to get the ratio of 12 to two? Six to one. Exactly. You divide each of these numbers by two. Six to one is exactly the same as a 12 to two ratio. So maybe the formula is C6H1. It's one of those, but it'd be something like that. He had no way to tell what it was. What Dalton actually did is he assumed something called the rule of simplicity, that if atoms could form different compounds based upon proportions like six to one or 12 to two, it would always form the simplest proportion. That may not have been a good assumption to make, but he did. So he thought the formula is actually C6H1 then. <clears throat>
If you're gonna make ethane, which is 12 grams of carbon to three grams of hydrogen or a 12 to three mass ratio, you could do that by taking 12 carbons and having them bond to three hydrogens because that would give you a mass ratio of 12 to three. So he would say an ethane molecule is C12H3 or with the rule of simplicity, because 12 and three can both be divided by three, that could simplify to be four to one. So ethane could be the formula C4H1. That makes sense, the thinking that Dalton's trying to use here. If you assume that these elements are made of atoms, then if the compounds are formed by specific ratios of those atoms, you're always gonna get a constant proportion by mass, thus the law of definite proportion. Now, carbon and hydrogen atoms do not weigh the same amount. And in fact, when Dalton did this in 1803, he thought that carbon atoms weighed six times more than hydrogen atoms, which is actually not true. So he was actually wrong on that count. But let's see if we can actually do the work that Dalton really did himself. He supposed that carbon atoms weigh six times more than hydrogen atoms. So if I wanna draw a picture of this because the carbon weighs so much more, I'm gonna make the carbon atom much bigger. But what's important is a little number in there. That carbon is supposed to weigh six times more than a hydrogen. So when we start looking at mass ratios, you've got to make those numbers inside the pictures equal the ratio. How would you get a compound whose mass ratio is 12 to one if the carbon atoms weigh six and the hydrogen atoms weigh one? Can you see how that would work? What do you think? How many of each? Two carbons, one hydrogen. Because if you had two carbons, six and six would be 12. That would make a mass of 12. One of these would make a mass of one. That would give you the right proportion. And so Dalton believed that ethine must have a molecule whose formula is C2H1. For the molecule ethene, because it's a 12 to two ratio, if I had two carbons that would add up to 12, I would need two hydrogens to add up to two. So ethene could be C2H2, or if you use the rule of simplicity, divide both those subscripts by two, you get C1H1, that would also be the same formula. So either of those could be the formula for ethene. And then the final one, ethane, if it's 12 grams of carbon to three grams of hydrogen, a 12 to three ratio, you can only get that by having two carbons and three hydrogens, the formula would have to look like this. Does that make sense? That's what Dalton was proposing. Now, the idea that we have here that carbon weighs six times more than a hydrogen atom isn't correct. Carbon atoms actually weigh 12 times more than a hydrogen. So I want you now to do your first problem on your own. If a carbon atom weighs 12 times more than a hydrogen atom, I want you to take one minute and see if you can predict what the formulas would be for these three different compounds, okay? So take a minute, see if you can do that, but you have to use the fact that a carbon atom weighs 12 times more than a hydrogen. So for the first compound, ethine, it's a 12 to one ratio. One carbon and one hydrogen makes the perfect ratio of 12 to one. So therefore, Dalton would predict that the formula of the compound would be C1H1. For the next one, 12 grams to two grams or 12 to two ratio, you need one big carbon atom, but it would have to bond to two hydrogens to get the ratio of 12 to two. So ethene would be C1H2. And to make ethane, you need a 12 to three ratio, so you need one carbon bonding to three hydrogens. It would have to be C1H3. That's what Dalton was able to visualize in his head, and he actually published this as his theory of atoms. And I wanna see if you understand that for your homework tomorrow, so we're gonna give you a chance to try to predict formulas of compounds based upon Dalton's idea that matter is composed of atoms. Now, these formulas we have written here, a couple things about them. 
When you write a formula, you never have to write a subscript one. I've just put that in there for emphasis. And when we figure out what the formula has to be based upon the mass ratio of the compound, it could actually be any proportion that's uh, giving you the same ratio. The first one, instead of C1H1, could actually be C2H2. The C1H2 could be C2H4, C3H6, C4H8. The last one could be C2H6, C3H9, etc. So we're actually only able to calculate empirical formulas, but that's actually how you predict the formulas for the compounds. So in 1808, Dalton published his theory and people read it and they went, oh my gosh, it has to be true because we have no explanation for the law of definite proportion. And because it explained a natural phenomenon, people believed it. Now, his theory made four points. First point was that elements are made up of indivisible particles called atoms. Second point, all atoms of a particular element, like all carbon atoms, they're all the same. Third, compounds are made when atoms of different elements combine with each other to produce little units called molecules. And that's important in terms of semantics and nomenclature. When you're talking about elemental things like iron and gold, the simplest particles of iron and gold are called atoms, not molecules, they're atoms. When you have compounds like salt or water, what's the simplest particle of water? It would be a molecule. So molecules are the smallest unit of a compound, whereas atoms are the smallest unit of an element. And his fourth point, uh, atoms of one element cannot change into atoms of another element. <clears throat> so this was so compelling, he never showed anybody an atom, but he gave them such strong circumstantial evidence that it actually was the explanation for the law of multiple, uh, uh, law of definite proportion that people believed it. And when I say people believed it, it took until about 1850 for all the chemists in the world to actually believe matter was made of atoms. Physicists, it took till 1900. They were a little bit harder to convince. But things actually happen in a slow process. You're actually living through that now, okay? We don't do anything about uh, carbon emissions. Is that gonna cause the uh, entire planet to die? Will all the glaciers melt? Will life stop to uh, exist if we don't do anything about that? There's some people who think you have to take strong measures to stop that, some people not so much. We're in the middle of a debate about that now, just like they were in a debate in the 1800s. Ours may be a little bit more significant to human life. But I tell you what, in 50 years, we're going to know who's right. And just like a Dalton, by 1850, we knew that, okay, Dalton must have been right because everybody believed with him. We didn't see our first atom with an electron microscope until 1971. So his circumstantial evidence was so compelling that for 160 years, people believed in atoms, even though they'd never seen one. So sometimes uh, circumstantial evidence can be very uh, significant. And based upon his work, Dalton prepared the first table for the masses of atoms because nobody thought atoms existed before. And so he was able to show that relative to each other, if you assume a hydrogen atom weighs one, a carbon weighs 12 times more, and an oxygen atom weighs 16 times more than a hydrogen, and a magnesium atom weighs 25, 24 times more than a hydrogen, you can see those numbers on each elemental block on the periodic table. They're more accurate now, but they're just the numbers in each block. They're the atomic mass of those particular elements, okay? So all seemed really good. It turns out that of these four points in Dalton's atomic theory, three of them were wrong. And the first one to disintegrate was point number one. Elements are made of, indiv or elements are made of indivisible atoms. By the end of the uh, 1800s, there was a physicist named J.J. Thompson that was doing experiments with cathode ray tubes. And Thomson's experiment actually showed that atoms could be broken down into smaller particles. If you create something smaller than an atom, it's called subatomic. So Thomson, no P in Thomson, discovered the first subatomic particle with a device that's a type of cathode ray tube, but they called at the time a Crookes tube. It's a sealed glass container that has two metallic uh, electrodes fused inside. One's called the anode, one's called the cathode. You hook it up to a battery, and people knew this before Thompson did this experimentation. 
they knew that if you plug this into a source of electricity, all of a sudden a beam of light would shoot off of the cathode and they called that a cathode ray. And Thompson was trying to figure out what is that cathode ray? So he made a couple of modifications to the Crookes tube to try to answer that. The first thing he did is he put a paddle wheel right in the path of the cathode ray, like this. And when he turned on the cathode, the Crookes tube, the cathode ray hit the paddle and it made the paddle move. That told him something. What was he trying to figure out? What would make a paddle move? What do you think? Mm, good question. If you go to the Orange County Fair back, oh, here's an answer coming in. Hold on, let me look. So what could it be? Some form of energy. Okay, I'm looking for something more specific. If you go to the fair and you get a pinwheel, how do you make your pinwheel spin? What do you have to do to it? And you can turn off your muting if you want to answer the question, that'd be fine. What do you think? How do you make a pinwheel move? Let's think back to our days when we were able to go to fairs. You blow on it. And when you blow on it, what are you doing to the pinwheel to make it move? You're pushing air molecules towards it. So that's really specific and that's exactly right. The air molecules that you blow out of your breath, those nitrogen molecules bang into the pinwheel and cause it to move. If you hold a pinwheel up and you take a flashlight and you shine a flashlight in the pinwheel, what does the pinwheel do? Nothing. Nothing. Right. And that's what Thompson was trying to figure out. Is the cathode ray a beam of light, which would do nothing to the, to, to the uh, paddle wheel there? Or was it a beam of particles, which would cause it to move? And the pinwheel moved, so therefore it must be a stream of particles. See that? So that's one thing he discovered about it. It must be a stream of particles because it made the, cath the pinwheel move. Then he made another Crookes tube where he put charged plates above and below where the cathode ray would go. And when the cathode ray passed through the charged plates, it bent towards the positive plate and away from the negative plate. What did that tell him about the cathode ray? It was positively or negatively charged. Right, because opposites attract, it's pulling towards the positive, so it must be negatively charged. So he did these two modifications to the Crookes tube to try to figure out what a cathode ray was. And his experiments showed that the cathode rays are composed of particles. That's the only explanation for the pinwheel spinning. And they must be negatively charged because they bent towards the positive plate. <clears throat> and then most interestingly of all now, at least for the chemist, that was important for the physicist, for the chemist, he'd made cathodes out of iron, aluminum, tin, nickel, silver. It didn't matter what elemental metal he made. Every single one of those gave off these negatively charged particles. So Thompson said, you know what? I think atoms of all elements must contain negatively charged particles. The atom must have smaller particles in it. So Thompson called these negatively charged particles electrons from the Greek word electra, which is the Greek word for amber. Have you ever heard of amber before? Kind of a gold colored stone or yellow color. Where have you heard amber? No, Jurassic Park. Talking about dinosaurs and yeah. prehistoric. So then Jurassic Park, there was like a tree sap that dropped and trapped a, a mosquito that had bitten a dinosaur and then it became a piece of amber and they pulled the mosquito out and took the DNA of the dinosaur out after that. So amber is like a, a orangish colored a stone that's made of hardened tree sap, but it turns out if you rub it with a uh, silk, it produces static electricity, it produces negative charge, and so Thompson called these particles that produce the negative charge electrons. And he found that electrons were emitted from atoms of all elements, so he concluded they must be a subatomic particle. And although he didn't have any further evidence of this, he actually proposed a model for the atom itself. It was called the plum pudding model. If you're not from England, you can have this pudding type of dessert that has raisins in it, and they call that plum pudding. 
and he imagined the raisins in the plum pudding were sort of how the electrons were distributed throughout an atom. The atom being a fairly soft material with electrons evenly distributed out of it. But how were the electrons actually arranged in the atom, nobody knew. And then the other important things, if the atom contains negative electrons, well, guess what? It better contain positive particles as well, right? So <clears throat> what those positive particles were was determined uh, 10 years later by Ernest Rutherford and some of his graduate students. Rutherford was a physicist. He actually came from New Zealand. He was a farmer. And when he was 18, he applied for a scholarship to Cambridge. And uh, he didn't win the scholarship. Some guy down the road won the scholarship instead because he was probably a better student or whatnot. But it turns out the other guy down the road decided he didn't want to go to Cambridge. He wanted to stay in New Zealand, marry his childhood sweetheart, and live on a farm the rest of his life. And so he turned down the scholarship and Rutherford got it instead. And he went to Cambridge and earned his PhD in physics. And so now later in life, Rutherford is a professor and he has graduate students working for him and they're trying to earn their PhD. And they have to take a number of classes, but they have to do an independent research project and they need an advisor to point them in the right direction. So Rutherford had a couple of students whose names were Marsden and Geiger. Geiger became famous for something else, but that's Chem 1B. And he needed to give them a project to do. So he said, why don't you take a radioactive source, shoot these radioactive alpha particles at a thin gold foil, and let's see what happens. Maybe it will tell us something about the structure of the atom. So Rutherford gave his graduate students an experiment to do that would actually eventually help determine the actual structure of the atom itself. That experiment was really just shooting of alpha particles at a really thin gold foil. <clears throat> now, alpha particles are given off by radioactive atoms like uranium and thorium and radium. So if you take a chunk of uranium and you put it in a big lead box, the lead box will protect you. But if you poke a hole in the lead box, then the alpha particles can escape out that hole. And you can make a beam of alpha particles. And they had a radioactive uranium source making a beam of alpha particles shooting towards a uh, thin piece of gold foil. So these radioactive alpha particles were small and they were positively charged. And the setup that these guys had to do was to make this whole contraption here that would have the uh, alpha source, the uranium atoms, in some kind of lead box, a hole drilled in it so that the only alpha particles could escape would be through the hole. They had a couple of lead shields in front with little holes drilled in it so you would uh, thin that stream of alpha particles down to a very thin beam. So eventually the beam of alpha particles could then hit a piece of gold foil that you put right in its path. Then all the way around the gold foil, they put essentially photographic film because if an alpha particle were to hit a photographic film, it would expose it at that spot and you could see where it actually hit. And so Rutherford in designing this experiment was going, well, we know the Thomson model, the atom, the old plum pudding model. The atom's pretty soft. These alpha particles are like bullets and to be like shooting bullets right at plum pudding. The bullets are going to pass right through. And he figured every alpha particle should pass right through the atoms of gold. So where would they expose the photographic film? It'd only be exposed chunk, right behind the gold foil like this. So he didn't think it was going to be a very informative experiment. It's going to be a lot of work for these guys to do, and they're going to be able to earn their PhD by doing it. When they actually did the work, they found something else happened as well. They found a few of the alpha particles, maybe one out of every 100,000, were deflected at a really severe angle, and they didn't know why. And so they ran into Rutherford's office and they all mulled over the information and they go, what can we do to explain this phenomenon? They needed a theory to explain it. And they came up with a theory that we now call the Rutherford model, the atom. And if you want to have alpha particles bounced away from the gold foil, those alpha particles must be hitting something hard. And because alpha particles are positive, they must be hitting something positive. So they thought there was a hard positive part of the atom. And that structure of the atom we now call the Rutherford model. It's like if you ever like eating a hot dog and you're chewing down, all of a sudden argh, you bite down on something hard, like it was like a piece of bone that got ground up in there. You go, oh my gosh, what's in this hot dog? I'm not eating hot dogs for the rest of my life. Well, same thing here. If the atoms, and here's a, <clears throat> a thin piece of gold foil, two atoms thick. If the atoms have a really hard, small spot that's positively charged, 
and you're shooting alpha particles at that gold foil, well, most of the alpha particles are gonna go right through. They're not gonna do anything. But every once in a while, an alpha particle just might line up, boink, with that hard spot and bounce back. And that would give you the results they had in the experiment. They said, this has to be what the atom looks like internally. The Thompson model must be wrong. This must be right. So the Rutherford model of the atom says that the atom has an extremely dense, positively charged nucleus, that's its core, surrounded by mostly empty space. And that's where the negative electrons are found in that mostly empty space surrounding that nucleus. <clears throat> now, other experiments were able to show how big an atom is and people eventually were able to determine approximately the diameter of an atom was one times 10 to the minus eighth centimeters. So if we know the diameter of an atom is one times 10 to the minus eight centimeters, from Rutherford's data, we can figure out how big the nucleus is because only one out of every 100,000 alpha particles got bounced back. So the nucleus's diameter has to only be one 100,000th of the entire atom. So what's 100,000th of 10 to the minus eighth? We have to divide it by 100,000, which is 10 to the fifth. Divide that by 10 to the fifth, you get 10 to the minus 13th. So relatively speaking, the diameter of a nucleus is really small compared to the diameter of an atom. And you'll have a homework question for tomorrow. We're gonna see if you can tell me how big does an atom's model have to be if you use the head of a pin to be the nucleus. And that'll be an interesting question. We'll see how that goes for tonight. Now, finally, Rutherford found that if he took the nuclei of hydrogen atoms and bombarded other atoms with them, he could change atoms of one element into another. That was another thing that Dalton said you could not do. So Rutherford proved him wrong. Rutherford found he could change one element into another by bombarding it with hydrogen nuclei. And because hydrogen was the lightest of all the elements, so the smallest one, he thought this hydrogen nucleus was actually really special. He says, that's a positive charged particle. Maybe that's the charged particle that makes up all atoms that counterbalances the electron. So he proposed that hydrogen nuclei were the positive subatomic particles that must make up atoms to balance out the negatively charged electrons. And he called a hydrogen nucleus a proton. So here by 1910, we finally reached the conclusion that we believe all matter, I shouldn't say that, all elemental matter in the universe is made of atoms. These atoms can combine together to form substances called compounds, and those compounds now exist as molecules. But he said that all, we believe that all elemental material is composed of very small particles called atoms. But these small particles called atoms are actually composed of even smaller particles called protons and neutrons, which are positive and negative. So therefore, all atoms are composed of two subatomic particles, the positive protons and the negative electrons. <clears throat>